Hello everybody, this is Ferris. I'm going to be talking today about hazard ratios. Um, now this is a topic that is not only important for biostatisticians and researchers, but it's also important for clinicians that are practicing uh, medicine and that are praising papers uh, relating to certain patients' orders to know what to do in certain patient conditions. So let's just dive into it. Alright, these are just uh, weird looking equations that I've just put into freak you up. Not to worry, we're not going to be talking about anything. Maybe just for this one a little bit. Alright. So let's say a patient of yours that is a 67 year old male with a history of non-small cell lung cancer uh, that you had put on conventional chemotherapy regimen comes in for follow-up. And he brings the topic of erlotinib because he saw the ad for erlotinib on a TV. And he was really convinced that this was a good drug and better than the conventional chemotherapy regimen he had been on. And he actually asked you to put him on it. So what do you really do? As usual, you go fishing online for erlotinib, uh, for studies that are evaluating it. And let's say you come across uh, this uh, uh, journal of medicine, New England Journal of Medicine study. So that's the abstract for it. So you start reading it and get to the point where it says, Progression-free survival was 2.2 months and 1.8 months, respectively. Hazard ratio of uh, 1.6, so that's the progression-free survival. But the overall survival was 6.7 months and 4.7 months, respectively, with a hazard ratio of 0.7. Of course, in favor of erlotinib. So let's just try to hold on here for a second and try to think what does this uh, hazard ratio really mean and this one what does it really mean so just take a minute to think about what this actually means all right well keep on to your thoughts we're going to come back to this very slide again so just keep them in mind so in a hypothetical three-year study of erlotinib here uh, I just made these numbers up for the purpose of explaining the concept here, so please don't relate this one to the to the New England Journal of Medicine one. So this is totally different one here for the practice of, uh, and the sake of just explaining the concept. All right, so let's say in this study that went on for three years, let's say that the numbers on the first year, at the end of the first year, were the following here. So could you please try to calculate the relative risk out of this table here? So you guys know that relative risk is the ratio of the uh, events rate and the treatment group to that and the placebo group, right? So in that case, it's going to be 3 over 7, that's 0.42. Well, let, why don't take a look at the second year and just try to do the same too. Just calculate the relative risk. You'll see that it's actually 0.38. All right, well, how about at the end of the study, at the end of the third year, that is, and try also to calculate the relative risk. So you see here it's actually 0.4. So here the question comes. What does the relative risk of 0.42 at the end of the first year really mean? And why is it different from that at the end of the second year and that at the end of the study? Why are these two, three numbers different? And which one do you actually eventually use and report in your study? Well, the answer to that is that uh, these are instantaneous relative risks that can apply only at the point in time at which they were calculated, not before and not after. Therefore, you can't really apply relative risk of 0.38 at, at the first in the first year nor can you do that in the third year. You can only do that at the end of the second year because that's where it was actually calculated. Therefore, the relative risks of pr prospective studies that is usually reported at the end of the study cannot apply at any time during the study other than that at the end of the study. So, Let's try to contrast that to hazard ratio. So relative risks are inst instantaneous and can only apply at the time at which uh, at which they were calculated. 
Now, hazard ratios, in contrast, provide a, an average measure of risk for, of dying, for example, over the whole period of the study through very complicated statistics, and therefore can be applied virtually any time during the study period. So that's a major difference between hazard ratios and relative risk. So by the way, hazard ratios and relative risk are uh, many, many times uh, used interchangeably, but, it's not, but that's not really technically uh, sound. So what is hazard ratio? To talk about that, let's first have a look at what is relative risk. That's also called risk ratio. So relative risk is actually the ratio of the probability of an event occurring in an exposed group to the probability of the same event in the comparison group, or the safe as the placebo group. Hazard ratio, on the other side, is the probability of an event occurring in the next time interval, if it has not yet occurred, of course, divided by the length of that interval. And this is pretty much what this equation really means. So, um, observed events in time interval divided by the number of those at risk divided by the time interval as that time interval approaches zero. Alright, so this is a general example of a trial that has had survival analysis. Now, where several patients here are shown to have uh, been recruited at different times, right? And a smiling face here denotes that this patient remained alive at the end of the study, and a sad face remains just means that he actually died during the study before the end of it. So patients A, uh, C, and E have died during the study. However, patients B and D have remained alive at the end of it. Let's take a look at this, another uh, totally different example. So in this uh, example here, you see that um, patient D remained alive, but we just didn't really know what happened to him later on at the end of the study. So this is what actually just means loss of follow-up. And it was, it was used to be called um, censored data, although this is a bit of an old term now. So now, if you want to analyze the data, we need to account for the loss of follow-up by some sort of a method, right? Let's say, for example, uh, worst case scenario, or best case scenario, or a per protocol, or, or any of the other uh, methods that are used to compensate and account for the loss of follow-up in this study. We can, we might be able to talk about that later on in a different lecture. But but if we use uh, survival analysis and hazard ratios, then whatever is available of the data about these patients especially those that are lost to follow up, will actually be included eventually in the analysis of that data, and therefore providing more power to the study. Um, so that's just saying what we have explained here. So time to event analysis has the advantage of incorporating all available information about patients, allowing for inclusion in data analysis, of course, of patients who have, who have failed to complete the trial or lost to follow up. And the way it does that is by uh, what is called regression modeling, which is a, a type of a bit of a complex statistic, statistics. Um, and that is uh, making comparisons between different groups at multiple points in time. However, re uh, relative risks in comparison cannot compensate for such deficit. So another point to keep in mind here between relative risk and hazard ratio is that relative risk is a cumulative measure that tells how many patients actually survived at the end of the study compared to how long they have survived which we can yield such information from survival analysis and hazard ratios. So a very good point here. How do we interpret hazard ratios? Now if you remember at the beginning of this small lecture we did ask that question, right? So let's get back to our study here and our, and our patients. Now that we have heard and learned what we have learned thus far, could you please also try to think again and see what a hazard ratio of 0.6 for progression-free survival really means and that of a 0.7 for overall survival? Just, just take a moment and think about it. 
So the answer to that is actually a hazard ratio of 0.6 means that at any point in time, this is a very good, a uh, very, very important part of the meaning, at any point in time, about half as many patients taking erlotinib are likely to die compared to those taking placebo. Alright, so generally when talking about hazard ratios and actually thinking about using and utilizing them, we need to think about the median survival and just keep it in mind. And the reason for that is that hazard ratios do not reflect a time unit of the study. Therefore, it should be clear that the hazard ratio is a relative measure of the effect and tells us nothing about absolute risk. And that's that's pretty pretty obvious, right? Because it's called hazard ratio. A ratio just means and means relative, right? Therefore, we can't really pull any absolute data from hazard ratios. So the need then comes to use uh, uh, absolute measures such as time units, right? And that's what we're using here, median survival. For example, a hazard ratio of 2, it does not really mean that patients will live twice longer, right? And therefore, median survival in each group of patients that we're making comparisons here should be used to determine absolute difference in natural time units. And that's what had been used in the, the study over here, if you remember. Uh, so let's read it again. Progression-free survival was 2.2 months. So that's what? That's time units, right? That's absolute measure. And 1.8 months, respectively. So that's used in conjunction with the relative measure, that is the hazard ratio. Alright, so another thing to also keep in mind when you think using and thinking about hazard ratios is the proportional hazard assumption. And um, to talk about this complex idea, which we'll, we'll, I'm just going to try to uh, explain it as simply as possible. So when a study reports one hazard ratio per time period, it is assumed that difference between groups was proportional. So graphically speaking, the Kaplan-Meier survival curves should have displayed a constant distance apart. And hazard ratios become meaningless when this assumption of probability is not satisfied. So let's just take a look at, the, at a uh, Kaplan-Meier curve. Now just forget about the x's and y's here. It's just too complex to, to think about. Let's just uh, think of this as group A and this as group B. So you see the uh, Kaplan-Meier curve displays two curves that, uh, that are constant, almost constant apart, and therefore we can apply the uh, hazard ratios. Can you think of examples where proportional hazard assumption does not hold true and therefore we cannot really use and interpret hazard ratios? Understandably, and that is when the uh, two Kaplan-Meier curves do not keep a constant distance apart, but they do intersect at some uh, point in, in, you know, in time, right? And to think of examples about uh, such situations where this actually does happen, let's think, for example, of a study about um, epidural uh, hematoma, okay? So patients with epidural hematoma, and you're doing a study about them comparing uh, medications and surgery. So the couple markers for these two groups of patients will not be uh, constant apart. Just They're just not, not going to be... Uh, not even closely parallel, because uh, the surgery uh, patient group will more likely have a, a kind of a spike upwards in mortality very shortly after surgery, and that is very, uh, very uh, expected of surgeries, right? As complications, as uh, you know, adverse reactions and stuff like that. So, if you try to think about another example, what would you think? Well, for example, let's take the example of uh, treating patients with MI with uh, TPA and um, and another medication. That's probably going to give a very similar uh, trend here. 
The proportional hazard assumption for hazard ratio estimation is strong and often unreasonably strong. That is because complications, adverse effects, and even late effects are all possible causes of change in the hazard rate over time. For instance, a surgical procedure may have high, ri high early risk, but excellent long-term outcomes. And another point to keep in mind here is that regardless of the shape of the hazard function, the survival function is always not increasing and is always between 1 and 0. That's because beasts are never going to resurrect, right? They're going to keep dying, but in a different trend. A third point here to keep in mind is that the rate of decrease of the survival curve increases with increasing hazard and with increasing size of the hazard function itself. Uh, so just before I end quickly here, I just want to say one last uh, uh, something to keep in mind. And that is, if the hazard ratio between groups remain constant, that is not a problem for interpretation. However, interpretation of hazard ratios become impossible when select selection bias exists between groups. For instance, a particularly risky surgery might result in the survival of a systematically more robust group who have had fared better under any of the competing treatment conditions making it look as if the risky procedure was better. Follow-up time is also important. For example, a cancer treatment associated with uh, better remission rates might, on follow-up, be associated with higher relapse rates. Therefore, the researcher's decision about when to follow up is arbitrary and may lead to, differ to very different reported hazard ratios. So, I'd like to thank you very much for listening to me. And if you have any thoughts or suggestions or questions, just please type them down in the uh, comments below, and I'd be very appreciative of you. Thank you very much.